Who is this that we call Satan? The English proper name Satan is a transliteration of the Greek Satanus, which in turn is a transliteration of a Hebrew word that means accuser or adversary. In the Old Testament, the word is used once as a proper name and elsewhere as a title. The translations of this word in Zechariah and Job appear to be proper names, but in Hebrew, the word is preceded by a definite article, the, so the Satan. Since Hebrew does not use definite articles for proper names, the application here of Satan is not as a proper name. Used as a title, it is not always applied to the same individual. It's a title given to humans, to Hadad, the Edomite, and Rezan, son of Elida, both in 1 Kings 11, also to unspecified divine beings in Zechariah and Job, and once to the angel of the Lord in Numbers. But in no instance is the bearer of the title portrayed as a fallen being in opposition to God. Satan in the Old Testament is indeed an adversary, only not an adversary of God. There are instead various individuals who fill this role that are appointed by Yahweh as adversaries of those that Yahweh wishes to oppose. The text of Isaiah 14 is traditionally used to promote the idea that Satan sought his own glory to be equal or even higher than God himself. But because of his rebellious heart, coupled with a large portion of overconfidence, God tosses him out of heaven and throws him down to earth with a third of the angels of heaven that become demons on earth as punishment for Satan's arrogance. Proof of this is that we find Satan in the Garden of Eden after creation. With a few differences, this is the dominant narrative of Satan's demise from heaven, with the addition of some verses from the book of Revelation supported by passages in Ezekiel. Moreover, the Isaiah passage gives the reasons for why Satan was kicked out of heaven, which is that he wanted to be like God. We call this pride. The implication of this popular narrative view is that there are lessons for us to give attention to. The lesson is don't be like God. Don't be so arrogant that you think you're better than God. So be humble and teachable in your heart. Submit to God's will. But is this what Isaiah says or even implies? The major problem is that Satan is not mentioned at all in this Isaiah passage. To shed light on this, we look at the context. With chapter 13, Isaiah begins a section on oracles of the future, prophecies of the future, blending the contemporary, the impending, and the eschatological to show that the Lord is keeping his word and fulfilling his promises. He begins with Babylon. Now, pride also characterized the king of Tyre in Ezekiel's prophecy in Ezekiel 28, which is often paired with this passage in Isaiah. Chapter 14 begins as a lament for Babylon. Lament is a powerful literary device, especially when used in the book of Psalms. The two superpowers of the day were Assyria and Babylon, with Babylon having the edge during Isaiah's day. One chapter earlier in chapter 13, we learn of the day of the Lord, which is a cosmic event. This phrase, day of the Lord, is often referenced as the eschatological fulfillment of God's judgment on nations, which in this application and in this case will be Babylon. So Babylon is prophesied as being doomed and destroyed. Anytime there is this kind of demise, there is lament. Thus, chapter 14 begins with a lament. But is it a real lament? No, it's a mock lament with a tinge of sarcasm thrown in. This is the literary gift of Isaiah as a prophet. He takes a traditional literary genre, the lament, then improvises upon this foundation, a taunt, a sarcastic funeral lament. So what or who is Isaiah mocking? He is mocking the death of Israel's oppressor. He was either a serious monarch, Sargon II, who likely was replaced by a later Babylonian monarch, probably Nebuchadnezzar. While Isaiah's prophecy historically refers <clears throat> to these human kings 
the church fathers were actually divided on this. It was Origen who claimed the language was too substantial, too powerful to describe a human king. What Origen was refuting was the use of hyperbole in this instance. But we see in Isaiah 55, 12, the prophet does exactly this when he says, you will indeed go out with joy and be peacefully guided. The mountains and the hills will break into singing before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. So this is poetic language, not literal. It is hyperbole at its best. And moreover, from verses 4 to 20, the literary style is in meter form. There are three beats in the first line and two beats in the second line and repeated throughout the passage. So it's da, 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 and so forth. This pattern of beats is typical of the meter found in dirges. So we know what Isaiah has in mind here. It fits the rhythmic pattern of a typical dirge or lament. This pattern is often found in the poems of the Book of Lamentations. It is a mock lament because, face it, nobody in the world is truly sad or in real mourning at the death of the Assyrian king. Are you really going to mourn the death of a destructive and violent king? Really? Later, the king arrives upon his death in Sheol, the underworld where the soul continues to live. His pretensions to power are mocked by the other kings there. The mocking continues. He had earlier ruled over kings, but now he is sort of stuck beneath the earth just as they are. So the mocking continues in verse 12, how you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn, how you are cut to the ground, you who laid the nations low. How is the fallen king in Sheol addressed by the other kings? His name is Day Star or Morning Star. His full name in Hebrew is Halel ben Shahar, meaning son of the dawn. This is how the name Lucifer is derived, and in the King James, from Day Star or Morning Star, and in the Latin Vulgate as Light Bearer. Later, Dante applies this name for Satan in his Inferno in the 14th century, and John Milton in Paradise Lost in the 17th century. This is the modern origin of equating Lucifer with Satan. But let's get back to verses 13 and 14. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the Mount of Assembly on the heights of Zaphon. I will ascend to the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. The Babylonian myth of Ishtar is founded upon the planet Venus, the morning star, and considered one of the brightest planets in the sky. There is a likely allusion here to the Canaanite myth of Ishtar. In ancient Canaanite religion, the morning star is personified as the god Atar, who attempted to seize the throne of Baal, but failing there, he descended and ruled the underworld. The reference to the heights of Zaphon underscores this point, since the summit of Zaphon was the dwelling place of the palace of Baal. Verses 15 and 16, but you are brought down to Sheol, to the depths of the pit. Those who see you will stare at you and ponder over you. While it is true that our Isaiah passage depicts the downfall of a powerful person with pride and arrogance before God, there is no direct connection textually to the image that is perpetuated in the popular narrative of the story throughout church history. In the early church, Tertullian and Gregory the Great saw in this passage a reference to the fall of Satan mentioned by Jesus in Luke 10, 18, which says, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. But this assumes the preexistence of Jesus, which is not something Luke ever writes on, nor is it a vision of the last judgment since the Luke in Jesus is not an apocalyptist. So if Jesus did not watch Satan fall before the garden, then what did Jesus see? The context of the Lucan passage gives us a clue. The 72 disciples have returned with joy saying, Lord, in your name, even the demons submit to us. 
The disciples were originally commissioned by Jesus to heal the sick, but they discovered that they could do more than this. They surprisingly discovered that even demons submit to them in Jesus' name. Jesus immediately responds by saying literally, I was watching, or I was watching repeatedly, implying continuous action, watching repeatedly Satan fall like lightning from heaven. In other words, building on the idea that Satan is the accuser or adversary, he is now deposed from his role of prosecuting humanity from the heavenly court of Yahweh. Jesus is saying he is watching the effects of the disciples' mission, the mission just completed by the 72. We could say that Jesus is really saying, I was watching you. I am still watching you because as you were casting demons out, Satan was losing his grip on power. As I was watching you, Satan has lost or at least beginning to lose his position of accuser in the heavenly court. It is these words that link the mission of the disciples with the fall of Satan. Here is Jesus affirming the mission of the disciples by referencing Satan's fall from power and influence. The reason Jesus does this is to remind the disciples that there is a superior joy they ought not to forget, the joy that their names are written in heaven. It is in this context that Jesus' comments make sense in speaking to the mission of the disciples. It is not to be understood as the pre-existent Christ observing the fall of Satan. There are questions that remain also of the interpretation of Satan falling like a flash of lightning. Is the lightning here a symbol of defeat, as Isaiah implies, or is it a symbol of aggression? Lightning is a weapon of the gods in Israel, in the ancient Near East, and in Greece. Remember the fire that fell from heaven to consume Elijah's sacrifice on Mount Carmel? The same root meaning for fall is used here. If this meaning is applied here, then Jesus' words are a caution to the disciples to not get too cocky about their spiritual victories on their mission. They must still be careful and watchful because Satan will fall like a bolt of lightning upon them. The current narrative on Satan's fall from heaven is centrally referenced to this quote from Jesus, his pre-existent eyewitness account, so to speak, of seeing Satan's fall. But understood contextually, both Luke and Isaiah, this reference is doubtful. The richness and boldness of these images in Isaiah in their reference to evil kings and deposed monarchs speak deeply to the psyche and soul of people under their rule. The obligatory lament can no longer be offered except disingenuously with mockery and sarcasm from the mouth of the prophet Isaiah. Evil personified and codified into a reality called Satan falls into the myth that humanity has dominion over all things that are given a name. Why not reduce our enemies to the names we give them? Let us not understand them by any other name or by any other factor. Let us not engage you in conversation and dialogue. Let me reduce you to what I have decided I shall name you. When we do this, of course, when we reduce the deep and complex and mysterious reality of how we are created in the Imago Dei is when we reduce ourselves. So it is not Satan that falls, but we are the ones that fall. We fall short of the glory that God has given us as the wonder of his creation. We can't take care of ourselves. We can't even steward the gifts God has given us because we can't even steward what he has given all of us. We can't even steward creation well. The truth that Isaiah expresses is that nations and empires will come and they will go. They will rise and they will also fall. They will dwell in Sheol and be mocked and ridiculed in false lament. Ask Egypt about Assyria. Ask Assyria about Babylon. Ask Babylon about Med Med uh, Medea and Persia. And ask Persia about Greece, and then ask Greece about Rome. We'll stop at that fallen empire. Isaiah says, 
Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world like a desert and overthrew its cities, who would not let his prisoners go home? All the kings of the nations lie in glory, each in his own tomb. But you are cast out away from your grave with like loathsome carrion, clothed with the dead, those pierced by the sword, who go down to the stones of the pit like a corpse trampled underfoot. You will not be joined with them in burial because you have destroyed your land and you have killed your people. Isaiah closes with a striking image of kings that are not buried properly. They die with no dignity. They have lived with no dignity. Their funeral is mocked with a sarcastic lament. The prophet Isaiah has signaled a warning. He follows a long line of watchmen who watch out for God's people. We need such watchmen today to signal similar warnings to us so that we bring dignity to our lives without falling prey to the reductionism of giving each other names and falsely claim that we can now control each other. <laughs>